Charlie will talk about what the project is all about, some of our best practice findings and what the future aspirations are for ongoing development. We're also joined today by Julie Searle, Waste Services Strategy Officer from Somerset Council. The FITSU project operates in partnership with uh, Somerset Council and operset, uh, operates across the Somerset area. Julie will share why the council started along this journey, along with the benefits they have seen and the local value FITSU has provided. Finally, we're so pleased to also be joined by Gareth Morton from EcoSurity. As Discovery Manager uh, at EcoSurity, Gareth manages the Exploration Fund, which provided the pilot funding to get Fixie off the ground. Without this funding, the Fixie project would not be here. And we are so very extremely grateful for all the support they have given and continue to give to the project. Gareth will be starting off our presentation today with a quick intro to the fund and some of the other projects they have helped come to life. Um, before I hand you over to Gareth, I'll give you a quick introduction to Resource Futures. Uh, next slide, please. Founded in 2006, uh, Resource Futures is an employee owned non profit distributing environmental consultancy with a 30 year heritage in the waste and resources sector. Our vision is to achieve a sustainable world with a focus on designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use for longer, and supporting and regenerating natural, uh, natural systems, a world designed according to circular economy principles. We're proud to be a B Corp with one of the highest scoring, uh, with one of the highest scores amongst UK environmental consultancies. Uh, we take an ethical approach to business to make a positive difference in the world. And we contribute to the communities we work and live in and take projects through initial design, pilot and delivery to review. Uh, next slide. We're proud to have we have a proud heritage in community action, and these are a few projects that we've managed, the oldest one of which, Community Repaint, will turn 30 this year. And you can find out more about our projects on our website. So without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Gareth. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on the Fixie Project, which of the Exploration Fund projects has been one of the best best ones, I have to say. It's been great that this project. Um, next slide, please, Julie. I'm just going to start off by, um, well, introduce this and go th through the Exploration Fund, um, what it was all about and why we, we funded such a, a, a range of stuff. EcoSurity, for those of you who don't know, is a compliance scheme. Um, we deal with uh, packaging, we and battery compliance for our customers uh, who range from, well, hundreds of, of companies from Nestle all the way down to quite some small companies. Um, and we wanted to go beyond uh, mere compliance, and that's a major part of what EcoSurity is about, and that's what my job is about. Uh, delivering above and beyond compliance. So we invested £1 million in our exploration fund, really looking at a whole range of innovation and, and research projects that would reduce the impact of packaging, batteries and, and we. We in 2020, 2020, 2019, I think it was first um, opened, there was an open call for projects, um, uh, projects wanting £150,000. Um, we had an independent uh, panel of judges that helped us select the final projects. Eight projects were successful and fully funded. And uh, yeah, we we have spent the one million on uh, those eight projects um, between 2020 and well, the end of this year, the last project will will complete. It's been a really, really great journey. Next slide, please. So the first round, we did, did the fund in two rounds. Um, first round, there were four well, four projects in each, and these are the first four. We had Fit for Reuse, Cell Mine, Maximising Recycling from Purpose-Built plat Flats, and Boss 2D. And I'm just going through each one, uh, give you a, an overview of what the project was about and, and what they've achieved. So next slide, Julie. Um, the first one then was, the slide comes up any second now, should be Fit for Reuse. Yes, it is. So this was a project working with the uh, reuse network to update their 20 year old guidance on uh, refurbishment of uh, white goods and other electronic products 
Um, that was completed July last year and it's online and I'm sure probably some of you out there will have will be uh, looking at this piece guidance. But if you're involved in in reuse and repair, this is an incredible store of in information. Uh, really, really worthwhile project to for us to fund. Next slide, please. The next one is the. Should be in a moment when it comes through on my screen. Attention, here we go. Um, is maximising recycling from purpose built flat. So this was a project that was looking at one of the last great recycling questions. How do you get people in flats to recycle properly? Uh, we worked with ReLondon and ran a pilot with four states in London, uh, a whole range of interventions looking at not only the, the, the practical stuff, the operational stuff, but also engaging householders. And it was, again, a really successful project. Um, the the interventions worked, lots of uh, recycling increase, capture rate, et cetera, et cetera. And we London has produced a toolkit uh, which you can access online. Um, well worth it if you are looking to improve and increase recycling from flats. So that was a really, really uh, another really good project. Next slide, please. Then we had something slightly different, BOSS 2D, which is a piece of equipment to separate um, flexible plastic films for re recycling. Basically, uh, separate the, the mono layer um, PE and PP film, you know, your vegetable bags and crisp packets, that sort of stuff from the, the heavier multi-layer and, and laminates. To basically um, sift out the good stuff from the not so good stuff for, for recycling. They built a pilot, um, piece of machinery, which you can see in that, that picture, which successfully separates the mono layer films um, to a purity of around about 95% and yields of about 8%. It's a real major breakthrough in terms of getting this stuff re recycled because it's challenging. So helping to fund this piece of machinery that, that takes this uh, step forward was another really good initiative. Next one, please. Um, and one that was completely different, Cellmine looked at how a, well, a better way of recycling lithium ion batteries, uh, separating the uh, constituent materials out of them um, in order to them to be recycled back into batteries. Novel technology, very much um, mad scientists in white coats kind of research with test tubes and all sorts of stuff like that going on. Uh, again, they successfully proved the concept um, and by the end of the project, they were able to separate um, cobalt, manganese, nickel from batteries or black mass to 99.5% purity, which is very, very good. Um, should do it in a more effective, cost effective and environmentally friendly way than industry standard. So another really, really exciting project. And we're still working with um, the Cellmine team on taking that project and that technology to market. Next slide. So now we think, I think we come to, yeah, the 2022 funded projects. Um, we had four projects, ZAP, Resolve, the Somerset Repair Bus, which is course Fixie, and then uh, the Bristol Refill Cup Scheme. Um, next slide, please. ZAP looks at how do you reduce and avoid packaging waste in construction, working with the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. Um, this project is finishing now-ish. In fact, I'm going to their end of project event tomorrow afternoon and we'll be presenting there and then launching their toolkit that came out of the project. Uh, toolkit is looking at a whole range of um, practical means by which building sites and construction sites can actually minimise uh, packaging waste uh, on the products that go on the site. So another innovative pro project, different sector, but looking at the same, same issue, how do you uh, reduce plastic waste? Um, Next slide, please. And then the Resolve project in Northern Ireland, looking at the issue of how do you separate plastic packaging waste from food waste uh, in anaerobic digestion plants? Um, novel idea um, and a challenging project to do that, but they've uh, they've come up with an interesting solution, and that project is ongoing again due to completion around about now, um, and they've produced a uh, piece of equipment that does the job um, 
and very, very efficiently. So it'd be interesting to see where that project goes. And the next one, um, the Somerset Repair Bus, Fixie. That's why we're all here. I won't dwell on it, but it has been a great project. Moving swiftly on. Next slide. The last one then um, is the Bristol Refill Return Cup Scheme. So for those of you in the Bristol area, you will know about this very, very soon. It's due to be launched uh, next month and we're running a, a, re a refill return cup scheme uh, or the city to sea who are running the project will be running uh, this, this scheme with a number of um, independent uh, cafes across Bristol uh, from June until about the end of the year. Um, ready to understand how this whole concept and how this market's going to work. There's already interest from uh, other uh, cities uh, and areas around the, the country, so it'd be really interesting to see how that project kind of goes and how it will then scale uh, to hopefully one day cover the whole of the UK. So that's the um, exploration fund projects, a real mix, really interesting, really varied set of projects and for me as a uh, died in the wool recycler who's been around the industry a long time, really, really fun and interesting um, projects to be in, involved with across the whole range of the stuff that EcoSurity does. Um, so that's it from me. I'll hand you over to um, whoever's coming next. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of this webinar because it will be interesting. Thanks very much, Gareth. Uh, so over to me, if I can have the, the next slide, please, Julie. So for those of you less familiar with the Fixie project, it's a mobile project running across the county of Somerset, promoting and raising awareness around reuse and repair with a particular focus on electricals. It's got three key messages, which are taking reuse and repair from niche to norm, loving your stuff for longer, and recycling is good, but reuse and repair are better. Next slide, please. So linked to those three messages are Fixie's uh, three core aims. So firstly, it's increasing engagement. So getting more and more people talking about reuse and repair, raising the profile and just starting to normalize those topics. The next step really is building capacity. So acknowledging for more people to get involved in repair and reuse, there needs to be more schemes and more opportunities. So um, a real focus of it has been building the capacity of the particularly voluntary uh, repair and reuse sectors uh, to ensure that uh, there's more ability for people to get involved. And then finally, increasing circularity. So putting into practice those ideas that wherever possible, um, things need to be repaired and reused rather than recycled and trying to provide some opportunities to do that within the project. Next slide, please. So in terms of our approach and our core activities, our approach uh, has been one of collaboration. Uh, the Fixie project is a partnership between three organisations. Ourselves, Resource Futures, who manage the work, um, providing independence, which we have found quite valuable in these kind of community projects, and also a lot of uh, experience in community action, um, as we've described. And then uh, Somerset Council, who've obviously got that uh, local responsibility for recycling, a lot of expertise in, in waste, but also a lot of local links into businesses, schools and the community groups themselves. And then finally, our partner Donate IT, who are an established local organisation uh, with an existing uh, tech donation scheme. And they had drop off points across the county and a desire and capacity to expand. So in terms of what the Fixie project comprised of, as well as our project management, we had a full time Fixie coordinator and a Fixie van, which you'll hear a lot more about later. And uh, in terms of its activities, uh, Fixie really attended a lot of public events, local festivals, um, workshops, um, uh, delivering talks. So finding as many ways as possible to have conversations with people. And the the types of groups that we were working with are were you know communities, the public, but also reaching into businesses and schools. The uh, the kind of other side of it, the capacity building really was about working and partnering with the local uh, repair and reuse groups and uh, supporting existing groups with their activities, but also 
Uh, one of the aims was to inspire new groups to form and new people to get involved in this kind of activity. And then finally, that circularity, which we'll hear a bit more about later, but uh, that was a combination really of, of tech amnesties, uh, particular events where we were collecting in items um, and also uh, just, you know, popping up in, in high streets, collecting items as well. And the kinds of things we're talking about would be um, laptops, uh, mobiles, any kind of smartphones, uh, de desktop PCs um, and just bringing in as much as we can into the project, but then through our tech partnership, um, able to refurb some of those items and get them back out into the community as donations to people in need, offering that really nice circular loop. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the van itself. So obviously uh, with, with funding, we were able to secure this van and cover it in really bold and visual branding to create that moving visual asset. Next slide, please. And then we kitted it out fully. So um, kitting it out for events with everything from solar panels for the electricity to the gazebo and publicity materials. We included within it resources to support repair. So pat testing kits and some electrical repair kits. Uh, and then we also included the equipment needed to support the collecting um, of smart tech items. So secure collapsible crates and waste scales. So that's a little bit of a flavour for the Fixie project. I'll now hand you over to Sarah to tell us a bit about how the project came about. Hi, everyone. So Fixie was actually quite a, a twinkle in the eye for Somerset Council for quite a while before we got involved. And Julie's going to go more into how they got to the point of approaching us later on towards the end of this webinar. Uh, but my story starts when they initially approached us at Resource Futures with a challenge. Um, Julie, do you want to move to the next slide? Um, thank you. So Somerset Council were keen to increase reuse across their area of jurisdiction. And the specifics of the FIXI project arose from the specific needs in Somerset. Um, so whilst repair and reuse is obviously a need in all areas, and that's why we're all here today. Um, replicating the FIXI project as is may not be the best fit for everyone. The needs and logistics and opportunities in every area are going to be different. And so what I want to talk to you today about is not the initial research that took us to this point, but the process that we went through that got us here to try and help you understand how you can unpick that story to see what will work best in your areas. Uh, next slide, please, Julie. You'll see coming up a range of steps we undertook to best answer this question for Somerset Council. Um, with the work that we do in Community Impact, we commonly take this type of approach to really unpick what is going to work and what is best needed in a particular area. So we always start with what's already going on, what local groups already exist, what are they doing, where are they placed, you know, from a heat map point of view of activity across your region. You can quickly see if there are gaps or big clusters, and that shows you potentially where you should be placing your focus. We were really lucky in Somerset that they had a really great relationship with a whole range of groups who were active. That's not always the case. We find with um, areas when we're working there, but it, it certainly helps. It doesn't hinder if we don't have those connections. We just have to work a bit harder. Um, but it really helped to have that trust already built in with Somerset Council. Um, so having mapped out what was already there, we then started looking at reuse models um, nationally and internationally. What are other people doing um, and what key learnings can we take away from that? When you're looking at different models, you need to make sure that they work within the area that you're in. So Somerset itself is particularly rural. It has quite poor tra public transport networks. So you want to understand what the, the particular scenario it is that you're in. Connectivity, employment and deprivation, all of those types of things are going to play a key part and it helps you identify um, what might be needed. And you can also look at key organisations already working in the space and seeing what they're offering. So having drawn that theoretical map, we then start conversations. We start with community groups, a quick survey um, just to get their initial views. Once we've got that, we can dig into the interesting responses and start giving them a call and having a chat, finding out a bit more what's going on. Interviewing other stakeholders to find out how they fit into this piece. What are they offering? What do they need? 
where are the gaps? All of these bits of information help us start to model up what's going on, what is needed and where best value can be added. And this is the approach we took with Fixie. Um, Julie, next slide, please. I'm not going to dwell on this slide, um, but this is just an example of the type of conceptual mapping that we find really useful. This is kind of mapping the flow of items around Somerset. Where are they ending up? Where are there particular points where we can um, introduce better functionality, better system processes? Where, where are the missing links? Uh, next slide, please. So if you are looking to introduce more reuse and repair, we recommend that you follow this particular kind of steps. Define your core aim first. You need to have that understanding of what you want to achieve. That's going to drive everything. Um, be sure you understand what's going on um, so you're not reinventing the wheel. There's really no point in doing things twice if it's already happening and it's working. Embrace it and work with it. So working with existing activities and partnerships is really useful and will help make the project much stronger. There's a lot of good work already happening, both possibly locally, nationally, internationally. There's always this kind of hunt for the best new innovation. And I would say, don't be afraid to adopt existing models that have proven to work just because you want to find something new. If you're happy it's gonna work in your context and it's worked somewhere else, then go for it. Um, and set those boundaries, make sure that the projects like this, which could have potential and unlimited opportunity, start small. If you try and go too big too fast, you're more likely to fall over. If you can define those boundaries, get things working, get that core hub going, then you can expand from there. Um, and that is that's it from me on this particular point. And I'm handing over to myself because the next part here is the Fixity project itself and where what we learned through it. So we've talked about that basic premise already. Charlie's talked about the different aims that we originally had. And I've talked about that kind of setting your boundaries early on. So we started with our three core needs of engagement, capacity and circularity. Those are the ones we figured we could have the most impact on and where we would best start the project. Julie, next slide, please. So one of the, the biggest ambitions for us was increasing that awareness and getting more people talking about reuse and repair. We know that this sector is growing, but there remain loads of people who are not engaging. They don't resonate with it. They don't get why it's relevant to them. This area for us was much more successful than we could have expected um, and hoped for, which is brilliant. We wanted to get that message across the whole of Somerset. It's a big area. It's very rural. There's quite a lot of um, underserved communities in terms of repair and reuse activities. In the, in the eight months that we were running, we got over to 84 different events and they spanned the whole of the area. This only helped having a mobile van. But the main people that we spoke to were so interested. So the fact that we we're able to speak to nearly 2000 people in that time and 200 of those in the launch event alone some of whom who'd already heard of us and we'd only actually started the project from having the van completely ready three days earlier, um, was a really big um, lesson for us. It was a great success. My first piece of advice when talking about these types of topics is if you haven't been to an event, and I'm sure a lot of people here have, but if you've not been to a repair event or the person in your organization who's gonna be a key decision maker um, linked to setting up this type of work has not been. You must make sure they go. The head of communications at Somerset Council had never been to a repair cafe and he went along as a, for academic purposes. He wanted to write a story, get a press article out. And his reaction when he came back to talk to us was so engaging. He was absolutely blown away and it was a real eureka moment for him because he, he got it. When you go along and you see how simple that concept is, how friendly the groups are, how much they're able to achieve, the fact that it's essentially all free, although donations are always welcome, it's a real eureka moment. It really brings the project to life and anybody working on projects like this, if they haven't experienced that, they won't be able to have that authentic excitement about the project. Um, 
So definitely make sure anyone who you need to get on side goes along and experiences it. We created a really detailed communications plan um, with Somerset Council communications and marketing team. And this really helped to set out our parameters. Julie, if you hit next, we should get a little summary of what we put into that. So we were focusing on our key audiences and our types of messaging. But what this really helped us with, again, with Fixie being so nebulous at the start and everybody thinking about it in a different way, it allowed us to really hone in on what we were going to focus on and where we wanted to put our most emphasis. So that provided us a super great grounding for the project and also helped us all get onto the same page. We wanted to make Fixie a household name in Somerset. Um, we can't say we've achieved that um, and it remains work in progress, but I think we've made great strides towards it. Um, we have people saying when they see the fixed event, it just makes them smile or they get excited to see it driving past. Um, I would say seize every opportunity to get your project into the news. There are loads of great little nuggets where you can start talking about it and getting people involved. We started with a public naming competition, so before the project was even up and running. Um, and this got people talking about it early. It gave us an excuse to talk to the press and it gave an excuse to get people involved. Um, we did end up with the name Fixie McFixface, Mc, which is quite hard to say actually. Um, but we knew that was going to happen and we actually deliberately chose that one. We managed the process by letting people put any suggestion in they wanted. We took those away and shortlisted and worked out what did we think we could work with. And we loved the name Fixie. And the Muck Fix Face is just a little Easter egg. You'll find it on the van in a couple of places, but we very rarely refer to it. But it, it just makes people smile. And that's what we want to do. We want to make people engage with it um, and see that we're not taking ourselves too seriously. But this is for everybody. And then we pick the final name out of that. We partnered really closely with the team at Somerset Council. Um, they brought in that community expertise, the waste and recycling expertise, um, and the communications marketing team. So as a group, we provided a really strong project team. We strategically decided not to set up dedicated social channels for Fixie. Um, it seems the obvious route to go, but actually at the time we had Somerset County Council's channels there was Somerset Waste Partnership and the four district councils. They all had existing people um, following them. They were all really well attended. And because of the project being so well bedded into Somerset, it didn't make sense to start from scratch and try and build that new audience. It made sense to springboard off those existing audiences. And it also didn't make sense to duplicate channels. If we've got to put content now on two sets, it's going to make it much harder for their communications team to keep on top of this. We want Fixie to become embedded into the council. So using those existing work um, social streams was really useful. And conversations at events are really critical and we wanted to make sure we um, best facilitated those. So we had a whole load of um, we had two folding tables and a bunch of stackable stools that were very cheap. Um, and that gave us real flexibility so we could have one table set up for the store and we kept that really simple with just leaflets a few um broken electricals as mainly paperweights but it gave a little talking point and then the other table we could set up either where someone people could come along and put their feet up at a busy event and we'd welcome them in you know put your feet up come and sit down have your coffee here and then you can start having informal conversations with them it also enables us to set up um, a repair desk with the van where we had a volunteer around so people could see repair in action. And it enabled us to, to litter the place with uh, leaflets and survey prompts to get people to engage um, with our survey, which I'll come on to in a bit. Next slide, please, Julie. Um, we wanted to be paper free. Um, that didn't work. It, interestingly, people absolutely loved a takeaway and this leaflet that we printed a short run of for the launch, we almost got rid of them all in the first event and we had to print more. We tried to reduce a one stop shop. We want to make repair really easy and accessible. So we put everything in one place. So here we've got the key message about repair and how people can do it the easiest way, why they should be doing it, addressing those barriers, showing people how they can get evolved 
and then on the back page that kind of one-stop shop of everything else they can do recycling centers curbside collections donations so keeping it really simple uh next slide please And we appreciate the Fixie van itself was a great visual draw, and many other people may not be able to afford the luxury of having a van alongside the project. Our general message was pretty simple, but having that impactful and moving prop certainly helped draw people in and start those conversations. So it's important, I think, how you can create similar impacts. Thinking about your project brand initially and how to make it fun and accessible so it works across a range of audiences is, is really important. And can you translate that brand into something visual, even if it's just magnetic signs to go on vehicles, like the vehicle toppers on a Domino's van, it might sound gimmicky, but it really felt that building up that brand identity helped us build engagement. Remember, what we're trying to do is normalize this type of activity, and there remain loads who don't associate with reuse or repair, so they will walk past things if it, if it doesn't grab their attention. We want to try and bridge that divide and make everybody realise this is this is for me, this is relevant to me, I want to get involved. It seemed that making it friendly, simple, relatable and being a van everywhere, that really helped. It all helped bridge that accessibility. So a few things that we did that are easily replicable, buying little festival flags. They're very tall, they're very cheap, they're very weather robust and they create a really great impact. That height means people can see them from very far away. Um, and it just made a really great statement and it was fun, it made people smile. We used double-sided storm banners, so outdoor banners. That meant if we had a short space, um, we could prioritize which messages we wanted to show because each side had a different message. And it also meant where you had larger space, people were seeing the messages from every angle. So that made it really, um, flexible. And then we had some selfie frames made up that really helps with publicity. You're getting other people to take the photos for you um, and help publicizing it through social media. So that was really useful for us. Next slide, please. Measuring impact was really important. We wanted to know how people were engaging and was this actually working? Um, and we can't stress enough how important it is to get on top of evaluating your metrics really early. We use a simple OneDrive file that was always updated after every event. It let us collect the quantitative stats, how many events, how many people, really simple stuff. But we wanted to do more than that. We wanted to know how this was impacting behaviour long term. What ripple effect were we having? Did people see us and forget about us? Or did they see us and start talking to others and making a change? We put in a, a survey which gave us a really simple way to do a benchmark of where people were at in their relationship with, with reuse and repair right from the start. But that just gave us a snapshot of where people were at then. But we realised that by strategically targeting this survey and asking people, can we contact you again? We could collect a body of knowledge that would allow us to get back in touch with people after three or six months and ask them similar questions and a few new ones. And that helped us see what they were doing since. And the results of that were really interesting. We've got some of them here. So we could see that people were um, starting to find, telling us that their commitment to repair and reuse was changing, that they were really committed into it. They were feeling better informed and actually they were now getting items fixed for themselves. We also had people saying they were talking to friends and family and sharing the information. So we could really see that it was having that impact. And we did use incentives to try and get people to complete that survey. And rather than giving them stuff or money to buy stuff, we used refurbished smart tech. So again, trying to increase that message of this is a perfectly great opportunity. These, there's nothing wrong with using smart tech items. Uh, next slide, please, Julie. My last point is my Alan Partridge aha moment, but the smart tech element for us was really, really valuable. Um, we prioritise this as one of our key objectives because whilst most smart tech, when we see it as end of life and end up putting it in a drawer because it has no more value to us, it's actually perfectly usable, perfectly reusable. 
people typically don't recycle it or hand it in because they're worried about data security or they're justifiably concerned about how they would repair it themselves. It's difficult, it's complicated, um, but there is a new life for it. We found that by introducing this element where people could donate their tech to us, we would get it securely stored, transferred over to the organization. They would data wipe it, refurbish it, and then give it back to people in need. And we could then publicize stories of who'd got that kit and what value it was adding. It just made so much sense. It resonated with people. That conversation was really useful. And it allowed people to go, I get it. I see now where there's value in repair. I'm confident to give you this stuff because I know you're going to look after it safely. And I know it's going to go to the right place. It's a really simple idea, but I, I think if you wanted to do anything around repair, this is the simplest place to start. Um, it's a conversation that really helps you get people talking about repair and reuse, and it really gets people on board. So you can see a few of the stats there about how people, after they'd spoken to us for the second time, were saying they were now more aware that their smart tech had value, that they could get it repair. And people are also more likely to think about buying refurbished. And it's really important that we can reduce that consumption of the new stuff piece and get people buying secondhand. And also, again, our KPI was very low on this and we absolutely smashed it with the amount of stuff that people brought us. Even on our first event, somebody brought us a piece of smart tech and we didn't even know that we'd advertise that. So it was a really successful piece. So I'm going to pass it over to Charlie now, who's going to talk more about how we set up that piece and other elements of best practice. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. Um, great. So we've heard quite a bit about some of the key successes and, and learnings. Um, what I'm just going to talk through is some best practice tips around partnership working. Um, navigating the responsibilities involved in these kind of projects, and then also a little bit about the future plans of FIXI. Um, next slide, please. So I think, you know, the first thing really is whether you've got a well-funded project or a more modest campaign, um, we really recommend that you uh, collaborate to and, and join the dots wherever possible to increase your impact and your reach. So we'd say the first thing to do really is to identify the type of partnership that's going to best benefit your local area, the local need and the project aims that you've defined. And um, we've certainly found in our partnership that that formal partnership um, enables you to work together. Each organisation can focus on different areas and that can really help to drive the project forwards. So we've heard a bit about how impactful that tech take back and donation piece was through this project. And uh, there are just more and more of those types of projects uh, springing up in different places. And then there are organisations like Back Market uh, gaining that kind of national reach. So the first thing we'd recommend that you do really when thinking about this kind of project is exploring who's doing what in the local area, whether that is, um, yeah, whether it's an existing uh, group such as Donate IT or someone with aspirations to do more, because it's such a simple and cost effective way to increase um, that local repair and reuse at a community and a business level. So if you do nothing else, we recommend that you do that. Um, yeah, the other thing that we found valuable is partnering closely with uh, town and parish councils. So another great way to increase reach. Uh, we partnered with Freem Council and hosted two large scale tech amnesty events um, with over it, just over those two events, over 700 items were collected and 1.3 tonnes went back into in for kind of um, refurbishment or reuse. Uh, and through that, what, what we did is we provided the promotion materials and Froome Council pushed that out through their channels and got this real kind of town wide buzz about it. Um, so with, that could be a really kind of easy and, and low cost way really to spread these messaging. Uh, all you'd really need to do is, is you know, partner with the local uh, town or parish council and provide them those materials and just let that build momentum and, and more and more groups will get involved. Uh, another area we found really valuable is finding ways to reach into schools. So I, if the first step for you would be to identify what is already happening in, in the local area around school engagement. So in Somerset, um, the council already had a partnership with Carymore, 
who were doing a schools um, against waste program that we were able to tie in the fixie messaging. Uh, which was a really great way of reaching into a much, much wider audience, uh, having children taking home these messages and also doing some pop up events at those schools as well. So there might well be similar um, schemes happening through the local authorities that you're in or local organisations already working, um, some environmental organisations working in schools. So it's thinking, how can you get those messages of reuse and repair into those existing um, into those existing relationships? Um, we found that uh, luckily Somerset had a good uh, kind of relationship with local businesses. They had a team that we could tie into there um, and that gave us access into local business networks. And that provided some really good ways to have these discussions, whether that was going out to a business and doing a talk or actually doing a tech amnesty within an organisation, thus embedding that kind of approach in an organisation long term. So it's leveraging what's already happening, um, what networks are already there. But even if there isn't that kind of local council business team, there'll be local commerce, um, uh, business um, development networks and forums that you can tie into. And, you know, if it's not tech amnesty, which is physically going out there and getting the items, then there would be opportunities to go along to events and talk and raise awareness or send messaging through existing business newsletters to just start to embed these kind of thoughts and messaging uh, across across different sectors. Um, and then finally, uh, we found, you know, good links with local organisations and groups were really key. And I'll, I'll talk in a bit more detail about our relationships and, and you know, work with repair groups. But um, it's also just thinking who's already doing stuff in the local area, who's already committed to reuse, um, who's already active in repair. We, we found uh, we partnered with an organisation called Adventure who had an aspiration to set up a reuse hub. So we were able to take Fixie along, pop up and just start to kind of build their uh, their kind of repair cafe activity as well. So um, now that Froom um, kind of hub Adventure is a is a long term tech donation hub. So they're now doing their own project around tech donation. So it builds momentum. It increases the reach. People have already got the ear of the community and, and you can just kind of piggyback off that. Um, and I think that also just boosts the reach in terms of uh, the tech donations as well, because you can then, as we did in Froom Adventure, we're able to kind of spread those messaging across the town along with the parish council and get some really impactful projects. So that's a very place based way um, that we found uh, worked really well. Next slide, please. So as we've described, um, so far, working with community repair groups was really central to the project's aims and also to our approach. Uh, the community repair groups offer local place based solutions to repair. Um, they're also key community building hubs. So our key message really is to tailor the project that you're developing to the local need of your group. So you need to be talking to your groups early on, listening, understanding what their needs are. In Somerset, we found that groups were struggling with having enough volunteers to deliver the activities or organise their activities. Um, and also, you know, maybe not enough capacity to promote what they were doing. And so there were key areas that they wanted support in, um, wanting to reach new audiences. Uh, that kind of echoes really the needs of groups that we find were, with that we work in other areas. So the Fixie pilot set about to support groups to address those. So Fixie sought to promote volunteering opportunities um, at any given opportunity, so at engagement events or tech amnesties, always talking not only about the messaging, but also ways that you might want to get involved. And through the pilot, it identified 40 people who might be interested in volunteering. So we were then able to pass those contacts on to the local groups, local to where those people lived. And I think the ability to do that really helped to build trust um, and with the repair groups early because they could really see the value of Fixie getting out there. And it's really a tangible value and a tangible benefit of volunteers coming into to, to their groups to boost their capacity. Um, 
and you know we, we did a lot of engagement face to face through that but again through a reduced project I guess it's thinking what are the net networks locally that you have to promote volunteering that might be within your local authority or within your local kind of organizational network how could you maybe support groups to increase their capacity and increase their reach uh, could you even promote volunteering opportunities through your organisations yourselves uh, to see if staff might want to take part in these events, which are often on Saturdays? So it's just thinking, you know, what other ways could you maybe support groups to to, to get more people involved? Because it's such a, it's such a key capacity limiter. And um, in addition to people who might want to just volunteer, we passed on people that might want to set up activity or groups of people wanting to set up activity, and we passed those back to uh, to Somerset Council. And um, we hope that having a presence out there and bringing repair to more people, um, you know, help to inspire people to take part in, in more uh, repair activities. So we did see a 19% increase in the number of groups operating in Somerset through the project. So um, Fixie supported with promotion and, uh, you know, events wherever possible. And I think that volunteer and uh, kind of repair groups really appreciated that support. We produced a simple handout of what's happening in your local area for the whole month that we'd give out at events so people knew where to go. Um, but we also linked all of the groups to the Somerset Council website. So there was a presence there and um, we then supported promoting their events through social channels, Facebook groups and other platforms like Nextdoor. Um, but Fixie also went one step further, literally. Um, our coordinator got out there into the community, putting up posters um, and also would be uh, tying that in with other engagement, like potentially going into schools, having messaging going into schools so that everyone's aware of what the local resources are. So, you know, there was a, a lot invested in that um, that outreach really within uh, the Fixie project, but even without that level of, of, of capacity, you could still be promoting the uh, work of local groups through your um, local websites or Facebook groups and just helping to raise awareness, whether there's the ability to get more press or media and PR involved to just shine a light on on what's already happening. So there's there's a lot of learning and potential um, to to do that on a, on a much reduced budget. And I think the key message really is it just takes time. You know, it takes time to build that trust. Our coordinator was, you know, in post on the ground for seven months. And over that time, built really good relationships with with the local repair groups. And uh, that's that's the type of investment that you might need to, to get that kind of good working relationship. Um, but it, it paid off dividends. So the repair groups, uh, these are some quotes for what they thought were the best things about Fixie. Uh, they're all keen to see Fixie continue. So, you know, anything from the enthusiasm and knowledge um, to that increased capacity for outreach to actually get out there. Uh, and then also finally that uh, it, it can be a bit of a central hub for repair groups. Um, somewhere to come to um, and somewhere to, to access support and that's that's something that we'd like to build in a bit more as well going forwards. Next slide please. So we did just want to touch on this because um, inevitably in a project like this there are going to be some legal elements to navigate um, and this is the type of areas where the project one needs to consider but it's also the kind of things that that Fixie or a similar project can actually support uh, groups with as well. Um, so they're, they're all things that take up quite a lot of time. So I'm going to touch on four key areas. Um, firstly, considering your legal obligations and trying to keep it simple. So for us, smart tech, our decision to do smart tech was strategic. Um, firstly, because we know that the need is there and it's it's you know it's not duplicating any other services. But, but also it's got a high resale value. So promoting, um, pro providing its initial destination is for refurbishment, then there's no need for it to be treated as waste and have the uh, waste carrier license. It's also safer to transport. Um, you know, it's, it's batteries are enclosed, so there's less fire risk in transportation. So yeah, it, it was really a good thing to, to kind of keep it simple when you're first setting up the project. It's not to say that you can't work with and deal with other types of electricals. In fact, we've got aspirations to do so, but you just need to engage with the right partners who've got that waste expertise or waste carrier license to enable you to carry out that element of the work. Secondly, GDPR, which we 
touched on slightly, but it is important to manage that risk because it's often not recycled at curbside um, smart tech for data security reasons. So, you know, you need to consider that when setting up your project. But uh, what we'd recommend is engaging a tech partner who can securely do that data wiping process and manage that securely and then also ensure that there's a clear chain of custody so that everyone who touches that item um, everybody who touches that item on the way to it being refurbished is trained and trusted. So thirdly, um, insurance, a key thing to get right, and there's two sides to that. There's obviously the insurance for the project, but also then the insurance of the groups that you're working with. So um, what we'd say is find an amenable insurer, someone who understands the voluntary repair sector and what you do and is supportive. Um, qualification shouldn't be a barrier as long as you do a good risk assessment process to show that somebody is competent and you've got good reasons as to why you think that they are um, and then if possible see if you can broker for groups uh, because it's a lot for for groups to take on board so certainly uh, if you can get a good relationship with an insurer then that would support them to access uh, good quality insurance and then finally uh, reducing risk and the admin around it really um, so we had obviously pat testing and our coordinator was qualified uh, so that helped repair groups we carried out robust risk assessments we were able to share that with support groups uh, with um, repair groups as well to support them with that kind of administrative burden so yeah i think there you know there are things that you need to consider but there are ways around all of these things and uh, getting on top of them will really support the repair groups that you're working with as well Next slide, please. So looking forwards then, um, we've got a lot of aspirations for the future of Fixie, um, recognising that there are a lack of electrical repair skills and also a need for more youth um, activities in Somerset. We'd love to explore some youth engagement opportunities. Um, we've got potential partnership with Adventure to do a tech um, repair group with young people to just boost that side of things. We'd like to reach into flats, especially because they've got no curbside collection and do some pop up events there, do some outreach. Uh, we'd love to take Fixie on the road. It's mobile, so it could go anywhere and be popping up at other events across the country. Linked to that, um, you know, it, it's a it's a replicable project. So we'd love to see Fixie um, happening all over the country. Um, that would be a, a really nice thing to see. We'd love to expand beyond electricals um, and move into other areas of repair and reuse as well. And linked to that is creating more loops. So uh, we've talked to repair groups through this process about whether or not they'd be happy to receive items in need of repair that were donated. So we could have an item donated into the project that isn't working, that is not smart tech, passed to a repair cafe or a repair group who could then repair that item and get it back out into the community. So having that similar loop around circularity for smart tech, but building that in other areas and other electricals and other items. And then finally, um, we've through this project built really good relationships with the local uh, voluntary sector and uh, local community groups. And we've identified that there is really a need for more support around some of the areas that we've touched on, um, volunteering, comms, uh, practical advice and support. So we have um, we're now just in the process of setting up our community action network in um, Somerset. So that would be supporting groups to get together, to collaborate, to inspire more action, but really give that that kind of capacity building uh, to be that kind of um, foundation for an even stronger network in Somerset working on reuse. So that is just a little bit of a flavour for what we'd like to do next. And I think a key thing that I'd like to say is if any of that um, speaks to you or if you're inspired by any of those things, then we would love to give some advice on how to develop some of those areas or even work in partnership to develop a project that's tailored to your local area. OK, well, that's all from me. I'll hand over to Julie to talk a little bit about the local value. Thanks, Charlie. So, hi everyone. Thanks for having me along. Uh, I'm Julie Sell, and I'm Strategy Officer for Somerset Council Waste Services. So, I'm going to talk about um, Fixie from the local authority perspective and 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 how it's benefited us. So, a little background about Somerset to start with. Um, Somerset Council's a new unitary authority came into being on the first of April this year. 
So before that, there were four districts. Uh, so that's Mendip, Sedgemoor, Somerset, Western Taunton and South Somerset District Council and Somerset County Council. And I was part of uh, Somerset Waste Partnership, which managed waste and recycling services on behalf of all those local authorities. So Somerset Waste Partnership has now become part of Somerset Council. So we are Somerset Council Waste Services now. <clears throat> and Somerset's a rural county, obviously in the southwest. We've got a population of about 560,000 people and that's spread over more than 260,000 households. We're a fairly big county and uh, it can take quite a long time to get from, from one end to the other. Um, and, and like uh, they've mentioned before there's there's a lack of that sort of public transport links between communities so um, a mobile project was really beneficial for us. <clears throat> so since 2007 when Somerset Waste Partnership formalised we've been doing a lot of work developing our collection services so making sure uh, there's one single collection service uh, across the county so that everybody can recycle the same where they are uh, we've just culminated that with the rollout of Recycle More um, between 2020 and 2022 with our collections contractor Suez and that gives us a comprehensive weekly recycling and food waste collection and that includes small electricals and batteries and uh, alongside that there's three weekly residual collections. So the introduction of that took our recycling rate to just over 56% which is uh, up from 52% previous year and we're really pleased with that. Uh, we know we've got an awful lot more to do, uh, particularly around waste prevention, reduction and moving waste up the hierarchy. So that is our, our, our priority now. We've got the sort of collection services sorted so now we want to do a lot more on reuse and repair. So with this in mind, uh, we alongside Suez commissioned Resource Futures to do some research into how we can improve reuse across the county. And we particularly wanted to look at solutions that didn't involve reuse shops on recycling sites. Uh, we have one and um, and we've got 16 recycling sites across the county, but most of them don't have space to, to host a reuse shop. So we wanted to see what other solutions there were out there and, and what best practice was help happening elsewhere in the country and globally. And we were also very clear that there are lots of community groups and organisations in the county already doing uh, a lot of brilliant work on, on reuse and repair and other sustainability projects. And we didn't want to take away from the work that they were doing, uh, but we wanted to find ways of working with them, <clears throat> supporting them and, and helping them grow. If, if that's what they needed. So Resource Futures provided us with, with a number of different options um, and including uh, the, the mobile repair bus. And as the, the EcoSurety Exploration Fund was, was opened, we agreed to partner with them for the bid. And we'd already been working uh, separately with Donate IT who were collecting and distributing smart tech around uh, the county um, during COVID, particularly to school children and, and other people. Um, so they became a, a, a very clear third partner for the project. Excuse me. So I've got to say, it, you know, Fixie has been a great project to work on. It's It's been such a feel good project. Uh, it really does make people happy. Um, considering that we are the council and we often get a bit of uh, criticism from people about things we do. Uh, I can honestly say I've, I've never seen a bad, a bad word said about Fixie. Um, people have been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, they talk about it to each other. They talk about it. Uh, to the councillors um, and the, that's the the big benefit I think to us is is opening up those conversations about reuse and repair and just bringing it as a concept to people and highlighting the amazing work that's being done by the community groups out there 
um, it's been really good for for raising awareness. And and I think you mentioned earlier that we we carry a list of the the groups out there, um, so that we can tell people, point people to the nearest one. And we found that people want to take that away because not only do they see that there's a group in their town, they see that there's a group somewhere else in the county that a friend or relative might take. Uh, to make use of and, and find it beneficial so so they take that sheet away so that they can go and talk about it more and spreading the word that way is is really really great uh, we've built some great relationships with the groups we 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 had um we have some good engagement with with groups already but this project has uh, brought us closer and and really built those relationships um very well We've had some great feedback about uh, about the coordinator and how coordinator and how helpful he's been, and you know as we've mentioned before that the tech take back has just exceeded all of our expectations. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bad throat. So, it the the tech take back is it, provided people with that avenue to get rid of uh, things they've been hoarding that they they're worried about getting rid of because they're concerned about data security or they don't know what to do with it and we've we've had several people come and speak to us at events they'll turn up and they say and um, we'll tell them about the tech take back and they'll be like oh i've got something so they'll they'll go home and a couple of hours later they'll come back with a, a pile of stuff to donate to us um so that's been really good and we've also been able to use the van to uh promote the curbside collections of, of small electricals and batteries as well. So if people have got something that isn't smart tech and they want to get to recycle it, we can we can point them in the direction of the repair cafe. If they can't get it fixed, then we can say it's OK, just put it out in your weekly curbside recy recycling collection and it can be taken away that way. So that really helps um, with making the service accessible to everybody. Um, so as we've mentioned, the the campaign to to name the van, that was great fun, and we had some really, really interesting results and some really inventive results. And I still can't say Fixie McFix face at all. So um, I'm glad we shortened it to Fixie. Um, and that whole that gate led us into the branding work, and all the branding uh, was designed in house by what was then Somerset County Council's design team and they've done such a fantastic job on it uh, they really got the ethos of the project and um, came up with some really good ideas they, they got it first time basically um, we were really excited by the the options they gave us and so that's that's just helped keep uh, the service um, local and in-house and uh, saves on on funds it helps with the visit visibility uh, we've got the van which is brilliant obviously but the banners and all the other sort of little bits really help us to do smaller events when um, when the van might not be suitable or isn't available so we can go into a little village hall and set up a stall have the banners there and talk to different audiences <clears throat> And we've gone to such a wide range of events. So we do uh, big, big sort of local events like uh, uh, the eat festivals and food fairs and markets where we get a lot of people in from different areas. But we also do much smaller hyper local events um, such as uh, cost of living support events, uh, talking cafes and little things with parish and town councils as well. And that again, helps us to to reach a really wide range of people we wanted to make sure that we weren't um weren't too green about it uh, because we know that uh, people have a lot of different motivations so we wanted to make sure we were spreading the message that it's not just about saving the planet it can save you money it can keep things going for longer it can um reduce your waste so we wanted to make sure there were lots of different avenues for the messaging as well uh, so 
with the repair groups uh we attended on the day in a lot of cases um sort of and and the fixie van will be a promotional presence signposting people to where the van uh, where the repair cafe is and um or other times we might go into to the the location where it was likely to be two or three days earlier um, so to promote that the, the repair group is happening later on that week and making sure people know that it's coming up. Uh, building the Fixie message into our Schools Against Waste programme um, has also been very valuable. Uh, we can take that reuse message and repair message into primary schools and uh, we know how, how much uh, children can put peer pressure on their, their parents as well and uh, educate them about this sort of thing and I think we can see from this slide here just about quite how much attitudes uh, around reuse and repair are starting to change over the the project and again it's, it's all very positive people um, committed to reuse and committed to repair and, and planning to visit their their local repair cafe um, getting stuff fixed uh, is, is really great and so there are wider benefits as well. It's not it's not just us at the council that have benefited. Uh, we have a raised awareness of the groups. We've had a lot of people express an interest in volunteering. Uh, a number of actively signed up and we've seen new groups start as well. Uh, but the the role that Fixie has played in the collection and redistribution of smart tech um, has been really huge as well. So working with Donate IT, uh, we've managed to get some new permanent collection points for Smart Tech uh, set up around the, the county, which improves access for people and knows they don't have to wait until Fixie is in their area to, to donate something that they've got for reuse. Fixie has also um, acted as a, a sort of round robin. It can go around to the collection points when it's in the area, pick up the smart tech and deliver it to donate IT. And that then frees up more of their time to, to actually do the refurbishment and the, the redistribution rather than running around trying to collect stuff. And it's also helped to get tech back out into the community. Um, so a little bit of a, a, a case study. Uh, we've got an organization in Somerset called uh, Spark. And they are brilliant uh, working to support the, the voluntary and community sector. There's a number of strands to the work they do. And one of them is uh, Spark IT, and that helps people uh, access digital services, um, tackle digital poverty and, and helps them get online when they need to and train people how to use the tech. And Fixie and Donate IT both worked with Spark on the logistics of this. So they would help uh, supply items through uh, that have been refurbished. Um, they can help uh, take stuff to Donate IT to be refurbished. And um, just the helping with the logistics of, of transporting that material around the county and getting it to the right place at the right time, making sure there's there's a uh, smart tech available that can be used by people uh, who need to use it. Um, so Fixie helped provide that link and um, and and again with the repair groups as well, um, just enabling stuff to be fixed, uh, helping people get their their smart tech fixed as well. And I think it's a really good demonstration about how Fixie supports the existing networks out there and helps to enable a lot more of that um, redistribution and making sure people can to get what they need. So I think ultimately this this slide shows um, a lot of the key results from from the project. Um, it's really exciting to see how it's ramped up over the year. You, we could see um, towards the end of the year, the activity really building up and, and a lot more going on. Um, and it's been, I think it, it, it's been a really great project. And I think we're just beginning to see the, the potential that it can have. That's it from me.
Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you also, Gareth, Charlie and Sarah. Um, we've heard lots about the project, uh, key successes, learnings and future plans, but now we'd like to throw the floor open to you guys and um, for a chance for you to ask your questions to the panel. So we've got a, a few questions already in the chat, um, but if you um, haven't added yours yet, please pop them in the chat and um, we will try and um, get through them all to the speakers. So I've got um, what first one here from Stuart Hammond um, and uh, Stuart asks whether um, he's keen to know uh, whether recruitment of experienced and or qualified repair personnel was an issue. Can we stay that one, Charlie? Yes, yes, I think you were there at Project Setup. Yeah, so this this was a really interesting topic. It took a lot of our time debating the competency versus qualification um, angle. We decided from our coordinator point of view that he didn't need to be a qualified electrician um, because trying to recruit somebody into a role who was great at communications, great at managing events, there were so many things he needed to do that adding in an additional element of being a qualified repairer was too much. And we also knew that he wouldn't be able to do physical repairs whilst talking to people and engaging at events. So we felt it was of less value. That also simplified our insurance. Um, but through the course of the project, we did a lot of research around this quality versus this competency versus qualification piece. And really, it just comes down to the insurance policy that you hold. So if you, um, we're very happy to talk to people afterwards about the types of insurance that are available and how you can get those set up because we're in the process of renegotiating insurance at the moment. But it may, so long as you are classifying what somebody is doing and what is what you need covered by the insurance policy, and so long as you can show that somebody has the correct competency, then they do not need to be qualified. So obviously it will depend on the insurer that you're using. But we find, interestingly, with a lot of community groups, they are either using qualified ex-electricians who are now retired, or they're using people who are really competent. And our partner, Donate IT, have a competency test. So if we did want to go down that route, we would be able to run that through them to show competency. But I hope that answers the question. We're very happy to pick that one up because it's it's quite nuanced. Thanks, Sarah. Um, to, to add to that, uh, Alan from Waste Savers here says um, that it is a challenge for all new repair projects. He also poses a question himself and asks, he says, great projects, uh, who covers the revenue costs and what is the sustainability model? I don't mind pitching in on that one. Um, so at the moment, the funding uh, that we received from EcoSurety enabled us to set up the launch um, to develop the van and to develop all of our assets and, and start to build momentum. So um, the current funding that we've got at the moment, we're delivering some events on, on a kind of reduced uh, scale, and that's coming from a pot of money between Somerset Council and Suez um and that's really just to keep the momentum going and then at the moment we are seeking other funding because um with, there is a lot of potential for sustainability in this model it's just going to take a little longer than the nine months to build that so we're exploring other avenues whether that is grant funding or corporate sponsorship um to kind of look at some additional funding to get us a bit further forwards but there is a sustainability um, element of the model, which is all of the time and repair work and refurbishment and uh, data wiping and everything done by Donate IT is all covered by the sale of equipment. Um, so there is definitely potential to build in funding sustainability when you're dealing with these kind of items where there is a value and a resale value. So 
currently we're kind of on a transition to be more sustainably funded um but there's always been that loop within there around the kind of sale of, of of tech items funding that element of the project so that's certainly something that um we will continue to um work with and potentially build but it's definitely something that you could build into a project from the from the outset thanks charlie um, another question here from Orla, Waste Project Officer for the London Borough of Ealing. Orla asks, has the success of Fixie shown any reduction of electrical contamination in curbside bins? I can take that one. Um, so our recycling service is curbside sort. Uh, so we don't have contamination of electricals in our recycling service uh, because anything that's placed in incorrectly can be left behind. Um, in terms of what's in the residual bin, we had some uh, waste composition analysis done in 2018 and we've just repeated that this year. So uh, we've got a baseline um, of, of tonnage in the residual bin and we are just waiting for the results uh, of the one that's just been done. So I believe it has. I've seen some initial um results and i believe it has gone down but we haven't got the full report yet so i need a little bit more uh, to confirm that there's another interesting piece i think julie there as well isn't there around the participation in that curbside collection because we um you've recently done a participation monitoring event to see how many people are actually putting electricals out so amongst all the other recycling and food is anybody actually putting out electricals and I've not seen the results of that yet, but I, I think the initial results were showing it was very low. And what we're hoping is that that benchmark of low participation in that service will increase the more fixy goes out with that one stop shop message of these are the activities you can engage with, make people more aware of that service. And we would hope to see people actually engaging more with it going forwards. Thank you. Um, another question here from Gordon. He says, uh, Gordon Fergus, he says, well done, EcoSurity. How do we get other PCS to be interested in reuse where the material hasn't entered the waste chain and generates evidence? PCS, I presume, means packaging compliance scheme. Um, good question. We've certainly kind of... Reuse is coming. It's becoming more or uh, subject of more interest to well, not only us, but our, some of our, our customers who've got an interest in that, this area. I think it will only grow, but it's early days yet. Um, reuse and repair. It's on the beginning of quite a long, long journey, I, I think. Uh, but the more publicity and information and awareness gets out about projects like this, the more it's going to generate that that interest, that sense of, OK, maybe it's not so hard that you can actually achieve um, some good stuff with these types of projects, that there are s s solutions. I think the hardest bit is trying to work out what to do and how to do it. And I know when this project started, um, I had quite a lot of conversations with Julie and Sarah about some of the issues we've been talking about. Um, because no one had really looked at them before um, or there was some practice out there question of whether how how good it was or, or or not so this is an emerging area that I think will grow slowly but steadily um, over, the, over the next few years Thanks, Gareth. And yes, uh, just to confirm, Gordon did mean, yeah, we produce a compliance scheme. Uh, we've got another question here from Fiona. Uh, Fiona says, I love this project. Just wondering if Donate IT have been able to keep on top of all of the donations. Uh, people are often keen to donate electronics, but the time required to refurbish and fix them makes it hard to manage. Yes, in 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 part. So I think that um, Donate IT, because they've got their sister company is Blackmore Computing. Uh, Blackmore Computing does uh, take in large kind of 
amounts of uh, date of sorry of technology from companies and data wipes it. Um, I think that they have been expanding. So I know that they've been recruiting more kind of apprentices and things like that to get involved in in some of the uh, the process of data wiping and refurbing. But I think the, the main issue and the main limiting factor for them has actually been getting the items. So I feel like they've got quite a good, uh, quite good capacity to actually clear, wipe and um, and then kind of resell because there is that sustainability loop in, in that model. But it is the logistical challenge of getting items from all over the county to their workshop. That's where Fixie was great. And that's something that on our kind of reduced model, we're struggling to support. But um, yeah, it's actually the ability to have some some um, way of moving those items around is actually the logistical challenge. And I feel like that's been the main issue for us uh, that Fixie was able to obviously contribute to. We had one particularly great, I think there was an even better one, but the one I know about was when we went to Glastonbury Abbey, the offices there, picked up a whole load of kit one day. We were doing some filming for our impact video at the same time. Um, that tech went back to donate IT and within two weeks it was out with a, um, a number of refugees, Ukrainian refugees and their families helping their kids get back online with schoolwork and speaking to family. And it was really nice to see how fast they could turn that around and get a positive story. So yeah, it, when it worked, it worked fabulously. Sometimes it took a bit longer, but it was a good system. Thanks, Charlie and Sarah. Um, I've got one other question here that I can see, and that's from uh, Karen. And Karen asks, did you have any issues with providing warranties, uh, for example, for repairs, health and safety issues with safety of repairs? It might be that Sarah and I both chip in on this, but um, I think so, yeah. with, with the repairs carried out, at uh, repair groups and voluntary, uh, you know, uh, events, they you, you aren't providing those kind of warranties. Um, we did have pat testing equipment, and um, our coordinator was trained in pat testing, so we're able to do that level of kind of testing for all electrical work. But each repair group will then have their own way of managing that process. So some will be that it's kind of like um, a learning experience alongside uh, a repairer, which is what you're doing when you're getting that repair done. Um, for others, it will be that pat testing. Um, so, yeah, it kind of it will vary from group to group how that um, how that repair is is managed. But from from the perspective of the project, uh, it was really about ensuring that there was that you know, pat testing happening on any on any item with the smart tech that we were uh, were kind of processing. Obviously, that was uh, a full refurb process. And uh, there is then a kind of, a, I believe, a, sh a short warranty on those items from Donate IT. So that whole process is, is kind of all tied up within that. But you do hit on a good question it is, you know, it's the thing that's why we in included a slide really about some of the red tape. Um, it's there are some grey areas and really is all about ensuring that the insurers that you're working with are happy with your risk assessment process uh, and that you've put all of the steps in all of the correct steps and measures to make sure that that repair is done by someone competent, that that item is tested if it's electrical before it goes out. Sarah, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Um, we had quite a lot of chats with different groups around their models. For doing the repairs, what kind of insurance were they using? What kind of um, disclaimers were they using? Different groups tend to take different approaches from what we could see. Some take very much this as an educational process. So you are sitting with me while I do the repair. I'm not a repair service. This is an educational process. So you're sitting with me, you're seeing what I'm doing. You may not pick up how to do it straight away, but it's giving you knowledge. And their disclaimer makes it very clear that this is a learning process and they are supporting you with it, but they they can't take liability if things go don't work out long term. There's a difference between being a commercial service and being an educational service. So there are different approaches to this. Um, I guess the other thing around PAT testing is that what we think would be really useful um, and we've done actually in our community action group some um, Devon project is provide a pat testing training to the community groups. So the full pat testing training is a two day qualification and it's very intense. But a lot of pat testing can be done visually. Are the cables 
safe, are the connections safe? You can do a lot of that without having to have any kit or any particularly formal training. And providing that to groups would be of real value. And just on another point, we did find that groups spend a lot of time trying to, to faff around the red tape. And if you can provide services that take that pressure away, so if that's making sure that they've got the right insurance, so you know that your public are safe, if they've got risk assessment, they can just edit and jump straight into If they've got all those types of the fiddly, papery, annoying bits, if you can take that away from them and let them do what they're best at and just crack on with the work, I think that's a really good symbiotic relationship. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we have got one more um, question here then, if we've got time, and that is from Rachel at Oxfordshire County Council. Um, who asks, how much funding did you initially obtain for setup and what were the outgoing costs? On ongoing, what were the ongoing costs? <laughs> we got 150,000 from the Eco Surety Exploration Fund. We've put some other costs in the impact report and we do urge you all to have a good read of that because it covers everything we've covered here plus more. Um, and we'll make sure we share a link to that afterwards. Um, the cost covered the purchase of our second-hand van, the refurbishment of it, or the installation of solar. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to afford a full-time coordinator, and I think that was super useful. It probably can be done with less time going forward, but having that person on the ground initially full-time was, was really great to build those relationships and get things running. Um, it covered the cost of buying all the kit, all the different tools, and then the management from our side. Um, so for the wider project to be pushing it forward, finding out the research around best practice and those kind of aspects all contributed in. So um, yeah, just point you towards the impact report, have a read of that. And if you've got any other questions, do just reach out and we're happy to chat. Ah, oh, thanks, Carolyn. That is the correct um, link, even though it has a different visual on it. <laughs> but there you go. I'll take that off. There you go. That's better. Um, OK, so I think that might be it um, in terms of the questions. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for coming along. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, as Sarah said, uh, we will be following up with a recording of the webinar and um, some uh, links to find out more about us and um, to stay in touch. So yeah, thank you very much for coming along today, everybody. Have a great rest of the week.